afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2022 conversation. Uh, this is the Konyesha Art Fund Artists uh, Monthly Conversation. And uh, Happy New Year to all of you. We are meeting for the first time this year, and it's always a pleasure and an honor to have you here in this space where we speak and talk and breathe all things art related. So it's an awesome pleasure. Allow me to hand over to our ever so gracious host, the, the amazing uh, OHT war, Mr. Nyanzi, and I will manage the back end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Happy New Year. Happy New Year all, and um, I'm glad to be back. By the way, we need to glorify God for being alive and able to work because we've lost, we lost a lot of people, many, many people, uh, both relatives, uh, professional colleagues, uh, people we didn't know or friends of friends, relatives of relatives. So it is a blessing that we are alive and we can communicate. First of all, and congratulations for having survived the lockdown too. Uh, <laughs> so now, today is a very special day. Why do I say it's a very special day? Because we are inching, inching towards, um, we're inching towards um, the uh, International Women's Day. And we have a wonderful woman and the discussion today is going to be about women in the creative industries breaking the bias. And we have a, a special person, Bivale Nambozo Nsengiumva, uh, who is the founder and director of the Babishai Niwe Poetry Foundation that mm -hmm. promotes African poetry. Mm -hmm. uh, she emerged first run up in 2010, Orbus uh, Press Poetry International Contest out of which she produced her first poetry collection, Unjumping. You see, Unjumping, now dressing, okay. In 2014, she was appointed the BBC Commonwealth Games Ambassador for Poetry, representing Uganda, and in 2012, received a distinction from her Masters of Fine Art in Creative Writing from Lancaster University. She's also the founder of Rich Diction Enterprises Limited that trends in public speaking and team building, uh, is a distinguished Toastmaster. Bivale reaches the prospect of traveling to every country of the world by the, by the age of 70. And now, and I'm, I'll be 70 on the 28th of October. So she's just challenging me that if I've not traveled the world by now, looks like I'm done. Well, we'll get here from her, but I would like to start by giving her an opportunity to tell us exactly Eh? who Bivale Nambozo Nsengiumva is. Biv, over to you. Owechitiwa, thank you so much. I really thank you for that introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. I really relish Saturday discussions because it's in between a hectic week for some people and a relaxing Sunday. So this is such a perfect time. Who am I? Recently, I changed my title to Creative Expression Ambassador. And that's because I'm always listening to different entrepreneurs, speakers all over the world, learning from coaches and people I admire. And they say the way you introduce yourself matters, the way you feel about yourself matters. And how I feel about myself is a Creative Expression Ambassador. Ambassadors travel, which I love, and I'm always finding new ways to creatively express myself. Like my hair, I've got one white braid uh, against this short hair. What do I create? A lot of poetry. I'm always writing, but I'm always thinking as well, thinking of ways in which I can contribute to my space and impact people. Poetry is one of those ways teaching in public speaking, listening to people and offering my own experience to the aim of helping them have a shift in the way they think so that their space improves. And when their space improves, then the other person's space improves. And then I've contributed to changing the environment. So a creative expression ambassador. I write books, 
biographies, I edit, I'm a mother of four wonderful queens, and I adore traveling around Uganda, around Africa, and I feel I'm just starting in that space. I'm just beginning to explore what the world is about. And I use that as well to tell stories, peel off the layers in those stories, the culture of people, understanding what makes them thrive and how they contribute to their communities as well. That's who I am. To tell us, no, that's not all. You, you, you are more than uh, what you have told us. <laughs> yes. You, you must have a family. You must have come from somewhere. I must have somewhere. a family. And you must have come from somewhere. I and also, I, this title ambassador rings a bell. There was one ambassador called Mugoya. Yes. Wow. How does this ambassador think? Is this a hereditary or? <laughs> Please go ahead. <laughs> yes, Herbert Mugoya was my father. And when I speak about my father, that's my happy place. When I'm training in public speaking, I say, when you're stuck, go to your happy place. So speaking about my father is my happy place. He was a diplomat and it was because of his work that I was able to spend a number of years of my childhood in London. And London is my happy place. When I think about the times we lived there in the 80s and late 70s, it was exciting. It was really extraordinary. And we had access to so much. I thought the world had access to all of that until we returned to Uganda. And I thought, what a different world. My father was amazing, studied political science. And when he passed on, he left wonderful memories for me. And I always desire to pass on the same to my children that they too travel the world and live in places where they have access to abundance because then they'll be able to appreciate what living fully means and then be able to pass that on to others. Many people think differently. They think, no, let your children learn to live stringent lives, therefore they'll work hard. I think if they live in abundance and appreciate abundance, they will work hard because they know what it means to have that and give it to others who do not. So they will be able to appreciate what lack means and what abundance means and make sure they can provide it. And what I appreciate as well is the culture. I belong to some of the old girls groups and the culture I appreciate from Gaza is that they are consistent and they are principled. I also appreciate that they introduced me to what it meant to have an understanding of God. What I appreciate about Makere College is that they opened up what it meant to have a relationship with God. So Gaza introduced the understanding, Makere College introduced the relationship with God mm -hmm. and what it meant to be part of a diverse world. And in the groups that I'm in with Makere College, they're open to so many diverse ideas on business and politics and economics and culture. And they really rally to support people. And so I, I love that I belong to both worlds. Throughout my mother's life, she's worked with plants. From when we were in London, she used to work at a place called B&Q with plants. From, from a young age, I saw my mom working with plants. You know when they say some people have green fingers? Hers are not only green, they're the color of roots, of plants, of chlorophyll, of everything you can imagine. She's such an earthly person. She understands everything about plants, about soil, about nurturing the earth. From a young age, she's never had any other job. At her wedding, she got married at 25 or 26. She uh, designed her own bouquet of flowers. One thing about my mother, she's consistent and diligent. She's also resilient. She works with grit and her landscaping business, her plant business is what has taken us through what you consider good schools in Uganda, paid for my tuition at Makere University, saw us through so much. She's a landscaper, a judge now of, are they 10 or nine grandchildren? She loves that by the way. And she's at home in Imperial, it does a landscaping business, travels around Uganda, looking at people's houses, designing them beautifully. And, you know, she thrives in green. If you went to her house, she'd prepare you a wonderful exotic salad. 
and then she'll show you around her plants. By the time you're done, you've had a good conversation, you've looked at the photos of her family, you've had wonderful herbal tea and salad, and then you've probably gone home with a new idea on how to design your house. Plus you've, the back of your car is probably full of plants. That's what a visit to my mother's like, and that's her life and she loves it. She's got a great community of friends as well, a network of people who have seen her through challenges and successes. And that's my mom, Elizabeth Mugwea, Betty. If you say Elizabeth, I'll be like, I have no idea who that is. So Betty. <laughs> um, Biv. Yes. You have told us about um, Ambassador Mugoya and his lovely wife. Then I have, before we even move to Mr. Nsenguyumva, I would like you to tell us about Salongo and Nalongo Kajubi. Oh. Those are your grandparents. <laughs> yes. You, you know, one thing that England When, when I talk about Salongo Kajubi, that is Professor Senteza Kajubi. She's yes. a granddaughter. Salongo and Nalongo were instrumental in many ways. I spent my senior six vacation at their home. My grandmother, oh my goodness. I remember when we'd be there for holidays, and she'll just say, here's the saucepan of Matoke, here's what, no discussion. Start peeling, start peeling. Wake up early, peel. You know, go to the garden, dig. She had Matoke plantation and what, and she would rear eggs and, and she was, her sister had a salon and they would hot comb her. And she was so, she was really industrious. On top of that on Sundays, I think she was head of Mother's Union, Namirembe Cathedral. So you'd have to go to Namirembe Cathedral in that cold chapel, it was cold. For a girl of 12, you're sitting there, in the cold Namirembe Chapel, listening to the Luganda service, because my grandmother, she didn't, it wasn't a discussion. She said, my child, my grandchild must know certain things. She should just grab, here, we're going. And I remember some days when she would drive us to Kampala parents, the way she would drive, people think taxi drivers are reckless. My grandmother, sometimes she wouldn't have her specs on and then she would squint in her, and she would accelerate at such a pace. I'd look at me like, what is wrong with you? We were so scared, my brother and I, every time she'd drive us to school, we would breathe a sigh of relief that we had actually arrived. And that's the grandmother I remember. My grandfather, he was great. He loved having people around. Before he died, he met his great grandchildren. So he did meet my eldest daughter who's 13. And my younger one was six weeks by the time he died. And I remember he held her and gave money as well. They don't remember him, unfortunately. My eldest was, three and a half or four when uh, Jaja died. She doesn't remember him. I'm like, what? He used to read books to you and stories. This is what he looked like. She's like, I don't remember anything. So that's the life we lived in, extended. And on my dad's side as well, I got to know many, many cousins and relatives um, who were really warm. You know, now we have WhatsApp groups and they come over from abroad and we get to meet each other, Zoom meetings with my dad's brother. He turned 82 the other day. I mean, it's, it's really wonderful the way I think also I'm more mature and accepting to what family means. And so, yeah, that, that was growing up. It was fantastic, actually. Very really good. Now that, I, have, yeah. <laughs> now that we have got yeah. where you are coming from, we like yeah. to see now you're becoming an adult. You've made a decision. Yes. And you have yeah. this um, Prince Charming. And you say <laughs> you can't be left on your feet. You accept off your feet. And you fall in love. <laughs> Yeah. Was he, was, I cannot, I will have to ask this for rhetorical purposes. Was he easily accepted? But I know there was no problem with the Kajubi family and the Mugoya family, the internationalists. Yeah. But I need to ask this question. Was it easy yes. for him to take an ambassador's you know, daughter? And a... Go ahead. You know, with all of that, I think by that time I had, I was really independent minded. What my family was concerned about is, is he able to look after you? We know you're an ambitious person, you're independent, you've got big dreams. I mean, I was about to do my master's and I had dreams and goals, studying to become better. Is he able to catch up with that pace? But I think I had gone through enough in my life to know that I am able to do things on my own. So even before I got married, I said, I'm not going to depend on anyone. 